Chapter 1, The Basis of the VSI. This section will argue for the existence of a violence-seeking impulse, examine current theories on motivation, drives and instincts, and explore the possibility of a connection with the largest acceptable expression of the VSI, dangerous sports, using professional wrestling as the prime example. There are several theories about motivation, drives and how society views failure that must be recognised in order to understand where, why and how the VSI originated. Drives are mostly associated in psychology with the motivation behind human behaviour that operates through instincts. This study will focus on those based on fear and desire. There is a motivation theory where psychological hedonism and desires are determined by attempts to gain optimum pleasure and to avoid pain. For the purposes of this study, maximising success and minimising the pain of failure. As early as the 1930s, psychologists had already identified that all humans have levels of aspiration. Through this, they had identified the fear of failure as the single largest factor in most of what we do, especially when it comes to setting goals for ourselves. The level of aspiration has its roots in anxiety, guilt, shame and feelings of inferiority. Rotter discovered that some people actually set goals low so they avoid the possibility of failing. He implied that people were actually scared of setting goals. By the end of the 1950s, the test anxiety questionnaire was established as a method of trying to place people's achievement, motivation and level of aspiration. This separated the population into two groups. Those that scored highly were quick at spotting positive achievement words and concerned with achieving success. They regarded incomplete answers as challenges to overcome. The rest of the population were slower, more cautious, in an attempt to avoid the chances of failure. Incomplete tasks were considered as being wrong. One difficulty was the level of ease at which the task was set. It needed to be hard enough so success was seen as a goal, worth the effort by participants, but not so hard that the participant became too cautious. The best way to protect what one believes is not to have it tested, and this seems to be the perfect way to do that. The participant may not always want to succeed, they may just simply want to avoid failure. A second problem is the difficulty in putting an objective measure on something so subjective. When all the assessor has to go by is the physiological symptoms of fear and interpretation of fearful circumstances. It follows then there are two types of people, those who do not want to fail and those who want to succeed. The second group of people see succeeding as important and worth the risk of failing. For them, failure is a challenge to overcome. Recently, a third category of people has been discovered that are fearful of success. They believe if they succeed, they still won't be happy and that in any case they are undeserving of the recognition success brings. One consequence of this can be self-destructive behaviour. Human action is based on the balance between fear of failure versus desire. To achieve, it is necessary to overcome the fear of failure. This means taking a risk. Risk and its connection with motivation was the subject of the 1960s research in this area. Murray, in 1965, identified press factors, areas of worry that lead to a decision having to be made between fear of failure and desire that were in subject-generated stories where the subject had to deal with situations not arising from their own personal needs. This was later developed into the thematic apperception test. Murray found three types of press factors. Legitimate demands, 
exhortations for success, avoidance of failure, efforts to teach, admonish, warn or exhort. Exercise of judicial, arrest, trial and arbitrary use of power. And catastrophe, physical conditions, destructions of belief, tragedy, loneliness, deprivation of loved ones, non-physical attack, major attacks on well-being. This can be related back to the two types of people that are already categorised. Those with the low achievement motivation had the judicial affecting them twice as much as the other two press factors, which were about equal. For those that had high achievement motivation were equally affected by the legitimate and judicial press, press factors, but almost never by catastrophe. In professional wrestling we constantly see injuries like those in catastrophe overcome and the life of the travelling performer is not seen as a deterrent to those wrestling. This suggests that participants would score highly on achievement motivation. Those with high achievement motivations don't seem to recognise or use as a motivation self-destructive force or avoidance force. They live to succeed and be the best they can. Pro wrestlers must surely belong to this category. From this it was considered the expectancy is the perceived probability of success. The incentive or desire is the value of the success in the face of risk. The strength to strive for success in a case like this is the drive. The disposition for success is created through habits formed by this process. In addition, the hormonic theory, McDougall 1920s, says behaviour is driven by basic instincts that strive for a goal. It proposes that motivation may develop in reflexes that allow young to survive. This particular theory comes across in the behavioristic model uh, of Pavlov and J.B. Watson in the area of unconscious motivation. By adulthood, these basic instincts have led to learned behaviour, and a conscious being is able to choose motivation, at which point the fear of failure may begin to dominate. Following this goal-directional behaviour begins. This is learned through conditioning of a sort, the exploration and play of childhood matures a person's motivated behaviours by attempts to master the physical environment and to obtain competence in so doing by means of his own effort. The social interaction at this level allows the spirit of competitiveness, the concept of curiosity, central to motivation. To emerge, the problem, the problem comes in determining curiosity's original drive. Some argue that curiosity must be a primary dark drive, just like the sexual. Others say it must be a secondary drive, because it is not apparent which primary drive it came from, nor how it can be a tool of survival. Curiosity and exploration of a dangerous area could lead to the organism's death. Perhaps it is the link by which the primary drive allows the secondary drive to be learned. Harlow certainly hints of it being independent from homeostatic drives. The importance for us lies in Blair's work. He states that without a high level of curiosity, people are prone to higher levels of sensation-seeking or thrill-seeking behaviour. The precursors to this stage are by definition the survival instincts and drives. These are the primary drives. They are innate and active from birth. Thorpe develops them as the complex of internal and external states and stimuli leading to a given behaviour which is always of survival value. It is likely that the VSI is an offshoot of an instinct at this level, unconscious and very old.